What's up, guys? My name is Mouton. I get to be the lead pastor of Relevant Church, and I'm so glad that you decided to tune in to one of our message replays. I believe that God has a word for you. Hey, listen, if you want to continue to support Relevant Church to be able to produce content that teaches the gospel and leads people to hope, go ahead and give a gift of any amount to giving.thisisrelevant.cc. You can sign up for recurring giving or give a one-time gift, but I want to let you know, every gift matters and allows us to take the gospel beyond our community, region, and world. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you are blessed by this message. Peace. I am so stoked and excited and, and just mind blown to be here in the building here in Niles, Michigan. And, and I am so excited to be talking to my relevant family. I've been a relevant family member for seven years right now. And if you don't know me, my name is Pastor Bobby Biber and I am family. Welcome home. Everybody, welcome home. And it is, I am so excited and, and privileged to talk to the Riverside people and the Niles, Michigan people at the same time in this season of growth and of new things. And today we're gonna to be talking about there is more. God has a plan, God has a purpose for both Niles, Michigan and Riverside, California to touch lives for the kingdom, to touch lives for the glory of God and to, and to make no, known the name of Jesus to all. And so as I, as I prepared today, for today's message, uh, I was just floored that there is more. Think about that. God's not done. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a shutdown, in the midst of a mandate of masks and staying home and all these things, there is more. See, they can try to shut down the church but they can never shut down Jesus. You see, last week we celebrated because, see, they tried that shutdown thing with Jesus. And they rolled this big rock and they put a couple guards in front of it. But nothing was going to stop Jesus from proclaiming that he was the Son of God, that, that, that the death that, that he died was not in vain, that everything that he promised that he was going to do, he did and the mandates and, and the lockdowns did not hold him down. And today we're going to talk about a similar story with a similar rock, but with a different character. See, today we're going to be in John chapter 11, and we're going to be focusing our attention right around verse 32. But let me set up the story a little bit. See, word came to Jesus that his good friend, Lazarus, was very sick. So his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent for him. And in verse 4, we see that uh, Jesus responds like this. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So he's making a proclamation that this is not going to end in death. But here's the interesting thing. Jesus waits two days before he even journeys to Mary and Martha, before he even starts to journey towards them with his good friend Lazarus being sick. And the, by the time he arrives, by the time he gets on the scene, Lazarus is not only dead, but he's been dead for four days. Now we come to the... the there is more moments. So in verse 32, we read, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, he fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when he saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in, in, in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid them? Laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not a man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone 
laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Wow. Four day delay. So often when we're praying for miracles in our lives, don't we sometimes adopt the Martha attitude? But Lord, if you had only not delayed, Lord, only if your timing would have been more perfect. Lord, only if you would have showed up when I called. It's interesting because the first takeaway we can, we, can, we can pull from this story is that Jesus connects with you in your experience. The scriptures say that he was deeply moved. People noticed the anguish and the destruction on Jesus' face. Wow. Sometimes we go... Jesus, you just don't get us. Jesus, you just don't understand what I'm going through. But here's the cool thing about Jesus. Aside from every other religion in the world, Jesus is the only God that can actually empathize with you. Because of outside of sin, Jesus experienced everything on this earth that we experience. He experienced sadness. He experienced hunger. He experienced thirst. He experienced joy. He experienced exhilaration. He experienced all of that. And guess what? He wants to meet you in that experience. He's not simply an observer watching you experience, but yet he is a participant and he wants to connect with you in that very experience. And then we come to the shortest Bible verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Some of us might be going through some difficulties right now. Some of us might be feeling like the world is coming down on us and we don't know where to go and we don't know where to turn and we don't feel like anybody understands what we're going through in our loss. But Jesus just didn't shed a tear. He just didn't cry. He openly wept. He wailed and he bawled. Or as the modern 2021 says, he had a good ugly cry. <laughs> he understands sorrow. He understands sadness. He understands hardships. He understands emotional difficulties. See, but then we get a little bit of Tension built up in verse 38 because things get a little real. So it says Jesus was moved and he came to the tomb and he, and, and he told Martha, take away the stone. But Lord, Martha said, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been in there four days. Hmm. Jesus issues a command and Martha comes back at him with logic. Jesus asked for something to be done in a supernatural way, and Martha comes back at him with a biology lesson. See, Martha is so engrossed in the natural, and she understands that Jesus is the supernatural, but she's so engrossed in her sorrow and, and, and in the natural state of the situation that she can't see the supernatural standing right in front of her. See, the essence, Jesus says, move the rock so I can show you. So what Jesus is saying, if you move the rock, I will show you. But you're overthinking and, you're, and, and, you're, and your desire to dwell in your logic and in the natural is keeping you from moving in faith. There are times that God wants to show you his secret will. 
But sometimes we just have to step into his revealed will. Let me give you an example of, of revealed and secret will. We all remember the, the story of Isaac and, and, and Abraham. You see, Isaac was told by God to take his son. Abraham was told to take his son Isaac. And the revealed will was to go to the city of Moriah and when he got to Moriah, God would tell him a mountain on which he was to sacrifice his son. See, that was the revealed will. The secret will was when Abraham steps in faith that he would see the supernatural secret will of God. So Abraham goes to the foot of the mountain and he and 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 you see this faith walk begin to to unfold he tells the servants stay here the boy and I are going to go up to the mountaintop and worship and we will be right back oh wait a second God told him to take Isaac to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him but here Abraham is is walking a faith like none other and says we're going up to the top and we We'll be back. Not I will be back. We will be back. So on the way up, Isaac says, Dad, Pops, just a slight observation here. We got the wood for the altar. We got some fire. We got some rope. But we're missing a small little thing. A sacrifice. Do you guys remember what Abraham said to him? He said, Son, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. So they continue to the top in the revealed will to go to the top of the mountain and sacrifice the son. That is the revealed will of God for Abraham. They get to the top. They build the altar. He ties his boy up, places him on the altar, raises the knife, and it is in that movement of faith that Abraham begins to see God's secret will for him. See, that, that, that faith of Abraham ignited God to move in faithfulness. So he's told to stop, and he's told to look over, and he sees a ram caught in the thicket, and he, un, and he unhangs up the if that's even a word, he unties the, the, the ram and he gives the sacrifice to the Lord. So God will give us a revealed will in our lives. But we have to step in faith to unlock and unleash that secret will of God. So the second takeaway from, from this from this lesson that we've got today, that, that there is more, is don't block your miracle with your logic. Whew. So many times we want to be up in here, and God wants us to be here. God says, I can do all things. All things are possible through me. And we have that moment of doubt and we let that fear seep in and we let the, and we let the, the, the devil and, and his minions whisper in our ear that, that it's impossible, that it can't happen, that you're, just, that you're just climbing up a mountain, that you'll have no fruit when you get to the top. But like I said at the beginning, but there's more. When you allow God to move in your heart and his spirit to speak to you through his word and through music and just the, the inkling that the Holy Spirit has and you move in faith and you block out your logic and not let your, your logic block your miracle, there'll be more. So let's read on. Verse 41 so they took the stone away, and then Jesus looked up and said, wait, sometimes when I'm preparing, God just says, don't gloss over that, Bobby. <laughs> you need to pause right there. And it seems like a very simple thing. I'm going to read it again. So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up. You see, because if we read previous verses, 
They went to the tomb, Jesus wept, and he looked at Martha and said, move the stone. The command was given to Martha to move the stone. But in verse 41, we, he, we read, they moved the stone. See, that is faith in action. Don't miss that. See, Martha came to her senses and realized who she was talking to and that, that she was dwelling in the natural and she decided to make a shift into the supernatural. And so they moved the stone and then Jesus went on to say, Father, thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you had sent me. You see, he said, he didn't say, Father, thank you for hearing me. He said, Father, thank you that you had heard me. See, at the very beginning of, of verse 32, we go back to that. He said in verse Four, I'm sorry, not 32, but go all the way back to verse 4. He said, when Jesus had heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the Son may be glorified through that. In that moment, Jesus was having a conversation with God and they were, they were in congruency with one another that if Martha stepped in faith, and people helped her that they were going to see the glory of God. That conversation was had two days before Lazarus even died, that conversation was being had. So Jesus calls out for Lazarus. See, that was a specific miracle for a specific man. But he wanted others to be a part of that miracle. So, so Lazarus comes out still bound by his grave clothes. He had his, the cloth around his head and his arms and legs were, were still bound by those cloths. So what Jesus said next is awesome. We read in the second half of verse 44, it says, Jesus said to them, again, take note. He, he didn't say it to Mary. He didn't say it to Martha. He said it to them. Take the grave clothes off of him and let him go. Isn't it interesting that, that one of Jesus' best friends and a follower of him was wrapped in grave clothes? And sometimes don't we as Christians get caught up in the mundane and, and, and life and forget to live for Jesus and we're bound sometimes by our grave clothes, our spiritual grave clothes. See, but that brings us to our final takeaway. Jesus wants us to be part of his miracles. Jesus wants to participate, us to participate in showing his love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness to the world. I'm standing in a building in Niles, Michigan that is going to house the people of God and it is going to welcome people home and it's going to bring the prodigals through the door. And I know that, that, that Riverside is on the cusp of doing something amazing. They're in a, a theater right now, but God's got a plan. And he wants, he wants you, Riverside, everybody listening to this, he wants you to be a part of that. Niles, something amazing is about to happen in this building. The dead are going to come to life. It's God's revealed will for us that we go out into all nations and bring people to Jesus so Jesus can transform them and that they can have life everlasting. That is the revealed will of God. But there are people that are dying every day without knowing Jesus. And Jesus is telling us, move the stone. And you will see the dead come to life. 
You will see the people that are drowning in their sins be resurrected in my blood and be given life everlasting. Do you understand, church, what that means and the weight of what is given to us as a gift to go out and do? Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Muta, they've been given a vision, they've been given direction. But just like Martha was given the direction, move the stone, and we read later on that they moved the stone. You join your faith with your pastor's faith and move the stone and watch the dead come to life. But you've got to realize that it takes us to get off of our comfortable chairs and to stand with our leaders and to take one step of faith into the revealed will of God and watch him unfold his faithfulness to, to us in our obedience to him and what he has called us to do and watch people flock into these buildings like never before. Watch lives be changed by never before. Watch marriages being resurrected. Watch fathers reconcile with their wives and their children. Watch families being baptized over and over and over again as a declaration that they are now followers of Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, we got to move the stone. So I challenge everybody listening to this today to just step out just this much into the uncomfortable. See, because Jesus doesn't dwell too much in the comfortable, but he hangs out a lot in the uncomfortable. And just like we read that Jesus wants to connect with us in our experiences, he'll meet you in your uncomfortableness. He'll meet you in your doubt. He'll meet you in your fear. And he'll meet you in your faithlessness. But if you sit in that uncomfortable place with Jesus and you just say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, he will give you the faith to move the stone. This world is dying for the good news of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, in most places, the church is dying and their desire to give it to them. But that all changes here. That all changes now. Relevant is growing. Relevant is flourishing. Relevant is sitting in the unknown and trusting that God will meet them in there and give them direction and give them provision and give them power and give them strength and give them faith to do what he has called them to do. So you just need to simply step. God doesn't ask for anything else but your obedience. But we're so scared to step into that obedience and we so often play that spiritual what-if game. Instead of playing the what if game, play the I know game. Because when I step, step into my uncomfortability, the I know game is I know Jesus will be there with me. Every step of the way, every uncomfortable, every fearful, every terrifying step of the way. And if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you know he's never let you down in the past and he won't let you down in the future. So you have nothing to lose, but you have everything to gain. And if I could rephrase that, the kingdom has nothing to lose, but everything to gain. So will you step in faith? Will you allow Jesus to connect with you in your experience? Will, will you Will you allow him to break through the blockade of logic and natural so you can step into the supernatural and do something amazing for God? Because Jesus wants us to be a part of our, his miracles. 
He's got plenty more to do. There is more. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for meeting us in our experiences. The good, the bad, the ugly. I just ask that you strengthen your believers. That you call them out into the uncomfortable where you are. Into your revealed will. So that when we take a step of faith, we can see your secret will and the kingdom can flourish. That people can come to a saving knowledge of you. That the church in America can go from that lukewarm church to that church on fire. That, that church with such a faith that we have a reckless abandonment for the gospel. You gave us your spirit of power and boldness. Ignite that in everyone listening. That they may experience you in your fullness to go out and do the things that you have called us to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.